And uh, let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your grace and for your mercy. Thank you so much for another day of life and for another study that you have given us, an opportunity to learn from you and learn about you and learn about what is to come. We just ask, Lord, that you would please be with us now as we open up your word. Please enter into this place, fill this place with your presence, with your Holy Spirit. Teach us, Lord, as you taught so very long ago on the shores of Galilee. And above all else, let Jesus be lifted up. Let not man be seen in any of us. Let your name be lifted up. The cross be seen. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. All righty. Well, uh, so today we are looking at part, what is this, part four now, I think, that we're on. Uh, we technically had a, a study last week as well, uh, but we kind of rehashed what we'd gone over the week before. So this is the next part of that study. If you want to see that, then you can go onto the website or onto the YouTube, uh, the King's Bard uh, on YouTube. Uh, I, I do now come up actually in the search uh, instead of just uh, instead of you know, a playlist or something like that. I, so uh, that actually helps a lot in finding me. I'm also on Facebook and I posted on there as well, page of the same name. Anyway, uh, so if you want to see part one, you can check that out uh, from two weeks ago, I believe it was. This week is part two. But before we do that, we're going to look at a bit of review just to kind of look over what we went over last week. So we were looking at the gospel and we're looking at uh, specifically Revelation chapter 14 and how Revelation 14 verses 6 and 7 is talking about the gospel uh, and how it's a little bit different than what we were looking at, uh, than what we would normally think of when we look at the gospel. Uh, and that, of course, is involving a message about the judgment that's happening now and also the Sabbath, especially, but the law of God as a whole, particularly the Sabbath. Uh, we also saw that uh, the gospel is demonstrated, it's manifested, it's demonstrated by meeting people's needs and caring for them. This is commonly called medical missionary work. This began to happen by 1892, historically. We saw that, but it's not happening now. We saw that it stopped. So the question then is, what happened? Right. But we're not going to look at that at the moment. We're going to look at what happens when it finally does go out. And if we look at what happens when it finally does go out, we'll eventually get to why it didn't happen last time why it didn't come to completion. We're going to start off with a quote from the Spirit of Prophecy here. Uh, manuscript number 52, 1900, page 14. Manuscript 52, 1900, paragraph 14. The three angels' messages are to be combined, giving their threefold light to the world. In, Revel in the Revelation, John says, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Then she continues on to quote the rest uh, of Revelation 18, verses 2 through 5. This represents the giving of the last and threefold message of warning to the world. So, all three of the three angels' messages in Revelation 14 are nicely condensed in Revelation 18. Now, I could have totally foregone this quote because it's not necessary. And the reason I know it's not necessary is because I had a whole study that I have done. I just looked at it and I figured it out and I was like, oh, hey, wow, look at this. All three angels' messages wrapped up. Man, that was a really long study. A year later, I'm going through the, the Bible commentary and then I see this and I go, oh, <laughs> she said it right here. Well, I mean, confirmation that I'm on the right path, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, which it's nice when that happens, because then you can say, well, no, it's, it's not anything that I got from Alan White. It's straight out of here. It's just that it takes a lot longer to prove out of here than she succinctly summarized it. So we're only going to stick with this. I'm not going to take you through the whole massive study. I'm, we will go over some of the same points, though. So... 
Let's take a look. Revelation 14, verses 6 through 12 is where we're going to start. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. This is all three of the three angels' messages. And if I have a volunteer to read those, that would be fantastic. Verses 6 through 12. Verse to twelve. Yeah. Oh, well. Then the third angel falls in a loud voice, and anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives this mark on his forehead and on his hand, he himself shall also drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out in full strength in the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of many angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night. All right, thank you. Now, uh, real quick, let's just summarize these three. Uh, these three. So, what's the first angel's message? Kind of, what's the what's the overall message here? Just summarize it. Okay, preach the gospel to the world, and um, talking about fear God, give glory to him. Okay, all righty. Uh, yeah, both of those, pretty much the same thing. What about the second angel's message? Babylon. Okay, Babylon is fallen. That's pretty simple. And the last one? Okay, don't worship the beast in his image. All righty. Now let's go to Revelation 18 and see what comparisons can be drawn here. Revelation 18, verses 1 through 4. And if I could have a volunteer for that. And after these things I saw that the angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lighted with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils. And the and and the fold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and painful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye may not partake, may not, that ye be not partakers of her sin, and that ye receive not her plagues. All right. One thing, like, you try to read it to yourself, but try to read those ye, they, those, yeah. thou, yeah. those. <laughs> it can be difficult. It can be difficult if you don't uh, understand early modern English. Um, yeah, King James English is a little difficult. But would you believe that's modern English? Um, that is modern English, yeah. That ain't old English. Old English you wouldn't be able to understand at all. Uh, in fact, most people couldn't even read it. It contains letters that we don't have today anymore. <laughs> um, and the pronunciation of the vowels is totally different. It's beautiful, but it's so hard it's very it's very different um it's not as hard to pronounce it as others but uh, anyway i'm going to get on a on a tangent if i keep doing that yeah uh, yes okay so that's now is there anything that's said before that in the text by the angel this angel has power okay it has power but what's the first thing the angel says Okay, which of the three angels' messages is that? The second one. All right, and then what does the angel say after that? Babylon has fallen, and is, you know, and then describes the condition of Babylon. 
then what does the angel say next? Or what, what happens next? What does a voice from heaven say? They put it in, the, in 14 or 18. 18. Come out of her. Yeah. Come out of her, okay. Is that parallel with any of the three angels' messages? No. Which one? No. I mean, Is it? Yeah. Let's see. Isn't it? Isn't it? Which one? It doesn't go with Babylon has fallen. It's a logical conclusion as a result of the third angel's message. Because the third angel's message is, remember, don't receive the mark of the beast, right? And this one is come out of Babylon. Yeah, exactly. It's If you receive the mark of the beast, you will receive of the punishment of those who follow the beast. If you don't receive the mark of the beast... You don't, right? And this one, of course, is the same way. Come out of her, my people. Right? Else you will do this, right? So interesting that God has people even in Babylon, right? Which is something that we need to remember. In Babylon. Yeah. But now what's interesting, Ellen White said there's three messages here, right? All three, first, second, and third angel's messages are all wrapped up here. But question, where's the first angel's message? Well, yeah, that's that. Uh, that would be uh, the three angels before. So it would the be first one. angel's message is sort of a loud voice. Fear God and His glory power. Yeah. So where's the first angel's message in Revelation 18? Really funny. He comes out with great authority. Yeah. And then he comes You've hit the nail on the head, even if you don't necessarily have the. That that is definitely there. I mean, That's definitely part of it. With great authority. Okay, so there's great authority and things like that. Interestingly enough, by the way, the second angel's message in Revelation 14 is the only one not proclaimed with a loud voice. But the second angel's message, it just says, "Then I saw another angel follow a second angel follow and say." Doesn't say it with a loud voice, and then the third angel comes with a loud voice. In Revelation 18, it says, it's, with a loud "Yeah, voice. with a with an exceedingly loud voice." The yeah, cried with a strong voice, cried mightily with a strong voice. So it's real, real strong emphasis here. You know, this is a very, very strong. And then, you know, this strong voice is the message that was proclaimed quietly in Revelation 14. Now it's proclaimed loudly. So that's an interesting parallel there. Um, but <laughs> we still have to figure out where is the first angel's message? Here. In 18, yeah. Because Ellen White says it's there, and I know that I've found it here, but y'all don't know it. <laughs> so, where is the first angel's message here? Well, in order to find that out... Is it four? No, uh, not quite. That's the third angel's message. We'll figure, we'll figure it out. So... <laughs> no, no. But... Remember, last week, and I think a week before, we looked at, I, no, I think it was just last week, we looked at Revelation 14, 6 and 7, and we saw a parallel between that and Isaiah 58, right? We saw a parallel between the first angel's message and the message of Isaiah 58. So maybe we can get an idea of where the first angel's message is if we look at Isaiah 58. So let's go to Isaiah 58, verse 8 first. Isaiah 58, verse 8. Isaiah chapter 58 and verse 8 first. And if I could have a volunteer. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine spring that shall spring forth speedily. Am I in the right place? Yep, you are. Speedily. And thy righteousness shall uh, go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Mm. Okay. And then the second. Yeah. It's twice as rear reward. Yep, uh, that's rear ward. It's an odd spelling of rear guard. Um, it's old. It, it's it's an older form of rear guard. Ward is really an English term. Guard is, I think, more French, um, but you know, so, ward is the original. And so the, the um, parable word for your life 
and so ah and Lori. Okay. Just let's look at the second half of verse 10 now, and I'll read this because I want to make sure that it's clear here. Uh, so verse 10 of Isaiah 58, second half. Then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. Now, some of y'all will have a bit of a different translation on that, but the same overall thing light, applies. Yeah. Light so there's light and glory involved. All righty, that's interesting. Now, question... Is the light and glory connected to medical missionary work in this chapter? In Revelation, Isaiah. In Isaiah 58. Yes. Yeah. If you read the whole chapter, it is. Yeah, and if you look at verse 10, it, the whole thing now, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then. He said to me, and that's like, yes. and, 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 yeah, in your life. Yeah, yeah. Starts up with the mindset that you're your soul to the hungry, meaning their needs, right? Mm -hmm. And satisfy the afflicted soul. So that's yeah. the one that is hurting. Then you're right. So there's a condition. Then you're right. Shall not yeah. yeah. Oh, Isaiah 58 is full of conditional statements. Yeah. If this, then that. Right? If this, then that. You know, it's interesting. When I was working as a um, uh, as an instructional assistant, as a program manager uh, for uh, at the at my previous job, uh, one thing that we would use frequently with our kids were conditional statements. If you do this, then you get this. If you want to play on electronics, then you need to do this. If you do this, you know, if you sit quietly and pay attention during lesson, then you get to earn a token or a ticket or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And so what you're doing is you are saying, if this, then that. If not this, then you don't get that, right? So it puts the it puts the onus on the person, right? So this is a conditional statement for God's people. If you do this, if God's people do this, then this will happen. But that's a little bit of a sidetrack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you wouldn't know it, would you? Um, although it is still important, it is something conditional, right? So this is still something that this is not guaranteed to happen unless the press, you know, the predicate is satisfied first. You first need to have the the condition of the prophecy that is reaching out to the hungry, satisfying the afflicted soul. You still you have to satisfy those requirements before the light that we see here is come out. Now, question: Do we see light anywhere in Revelation eighteen? Let's go to Revelation eighteen. Where do we see? <laughs> yes. Like I said, I told you you were right. Just yeah. So where do we see the first angel's message then? Eighteen one. What specifically in 18.1? The earth is illuminated with his glory. There we go. The earth is illuminated with his glory. I'm going to go off the script here. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yes. I'm going to go off the script here. Let's go to the... Or Wait. No. No, that's not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Never mind. That won't connect as well as I'm wanting it to. So, better question here. Oh, do we have a question? Uh, isn't it just like uh, giving to the hungry and like helping them, but it's not just like regular missionary work though? Like, it should be. <laughs> it should be. Um, unfortunately, it's often not. Um, however, it's more than that. You're not just meeting people's physical needs, you although that is a big than part. Than You've got to do more than that. And you're not just meeting people's needs with food and drink. There's also medical care that you can give to people. You know, uh, There's also other things that you can do. Um, back in the 1800s, 1890s, one thing that people did was they had groups of young people who they just sent around knocking on doors saying, hey, what do you need? You need grocery shopping done? Do you need you know, babysitting for your kids? Do you need... Uh, wood chopped because you know back then they didn't have electric heating so you know you had to chop the wood if you wanted to survive um, you know do you need uh, anything you know any other manual labor around the house yard you know landscaping you know landscaping things like that 
missionary, but not medical aspect. Yeah, not necessarily. It's um, it's called medical missionary work. It's all lumped together in that, but um, an earlier term for it that uh, honestly, Ke uh, Ellen White probably got the term medical missionary work from Kellogg, who probably got it from other church denominations. However, um, the, the term that Ellen White used before to refer to medical missionary work, what we would now call medical missionary work, is just simply the benevolent work. The benevolent work, which is just the act. Uh, in fact, she, she also calls it disinterested benevolence. Doing something good for somebody without any thought or any reason to, you know, you, you're not getting anything back for it. And you know that that's not the purpose of which you're doing it. You're not doing it to, to get anything. You're just doing it because. You mentioned that on last week's call, how the Spirit talks a lot about self denial. Um, but it's not just to be self denial, it's mm -hmm. to give back to yeah. the community. Yeah. That's an example. Yeah. And what are you doing to show them that love? They don't want to support you. They have to be seen. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's exactly the case. You're manifesting God's love to them. In fact, in some cases, we will be the only Jesus that some people will ever see. Absolutely. And then he says, follow me. And that's like, what we're supposed to be doing. Um, yeah, absolutely. Gain your trust. Yeah. And then say, hey, yeah. look at yeah, what is that? Let's see. Success. Ministry of Healing 143, page 143, paragraph 3. Christ's mm -hmm. method alone will bring true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them follow me. Uh, uh, it's been a long time since I've recited that one from memory. Then, at the end, so he ministered to their needs, then won their confidence, then and he then he asked them to follow me. Right. So there's there's a, you know, you want to do the best good that you can do for somebody. Yeah, exactly. It's something you're wanting to do as much as you can for someone. And if that's just giving them a drink of water, that's fine. But if you can do more for them, then absolutely. Um, I recall an individual who I was uh, messaging on social media. He had posted on uh, on the website that uh, suicide note, basically. And, um, you know, just overall... You know, was feeling pretty down and, and whatnot, and so I said, "Hey, you know, if, you know," I left a comment saying, "Hey, if you want to, you know, talk anything like that, let me know. Uh, just, you know, you can message me and such." And they, uh, he did end up doing that, and we messaged and we talked for a little bit, and then I mentioned, you know, you know, he just, you know, was going off about how he didn't have a lot of hope and things, and I said, "Well, you know, I'm, you know." I am a Christian. I hope you don't mind me bringing this up, but I do find my hope in Jesus and, you know, kind of explaining that. Well, then it came out. They didn't need help so much with the depression itself or with, you know, the anxiety that was coming as, you know, uh, you know, that was coming that had caused that because the root cause of that depression and anxiety was their belief about God. They believed that God was not, uh, did not love them. They believed that God could not love them. This was, that comes a lot of, yeah, a lot, of a lot of people. Well, it's because we're human, and we, you know, we have this we're innate sense of justice. Yeah, Zero. exactly. We we recognize that we are not who we are, uh, are ought to be. Right? We recognize that we are not exactly. worthy of God's love. That um, we are, and we have still have that sense of justice in us from all the way back when God, the God of justice, made us in His image. That's still there, and so we see that, and we go, hey. I compare myself to what I'm supposed to be, according to the Bible, and uh, I'm not that. Uh, you know. <laughs> if, if we think that we have fallen short, and we can see that of ourselves, yeah. how can God accept us because yeah. we know we've fallen short? Yeah, exactly. So he's at this higher level, it's like I just can't make it yeah. to that point. Yeah. And people are doing this or striving on themselves. Yeah. As opposed to that old term that says, give up and give God. Yeah. And, well, the whole thing is that 
Yeah. There's no way that I can succeed. Yeah, we and can't I, reconcile I don't ourselves have with God. Money to buy the golden ticket. <laughs> uh, you know, because the ticket paid for by Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, of course. I mean. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I, you know, I figured that this person had probably heard all that, and so I said, "Well, hey, you know, Paul probably felt the same way, you know. When you know, I mean, you think about it." Yeah, yeah, exactly. He was—he wasn't just, you know. Yeah, exactly. If anyone was unworthy, it was Paul, right? So why would Paul, you know, you know, how would how could God do that to Paul? You know, well, you know, but God not only brought him back, but also said, "Hey, now you can tell everyone else about this." And you know, it's like, yeah, you know, whatever. And then I said, "Well, hey, you know, let me tell you about Manasseh." Oh yeah. Manasseh is the most wicked king that ever ruled either Israel or Judah. He, um, how do I, uh, he, he, slaughtered. yeah, slaughtered hundreds, if not thousands of prophets. He killed Isaiah, the one from the Bible, killed Isaiah by having him shoved in a log and sawn in half. Um, I mean, it was, you know, just some horrible things. And then he was captured by the Assyrians, had hooks put through his flesh, and he was taken across the desert to... Uh, Assyria and to Nineveh, and he was in chains there in the Assyrian capital. And then, uh, as he was sitting there, he repented. He prayed to God. And I said, "You know what God did? God not only sent him back, and gave him his freedom, but He sent him back to Judah, put him back on the throne, and then let him be the longest reigning king in all of Judean history. Reigned for fifty-five years." I wonder why Isaiah didn't. Yeah, I bet you Isaiah's going to go, well, I don't know how you're here, but praise the Lord for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, and then I said, you know, I mean, for goodness sake, Jesus died for Hitler. Yeah. What makes you think he wouldn't, you know, Jesus loves Hitler. Jesus would forgive the devil and reinstate him into his position. Why wouldn't he reinstate any one of us? So do you know what you just described? <laughs> Enlightened by his glory. See, there's nothing in our darkness that, you know, they say dark cannot exist in a room full of light. So when Christ comes in, all the darkness is shoved aside. Yeah. And so that's the light, you know, yep. when Jesus comes in our presence, we're enlightened by his glory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I really like that. Yeah. Now, there's a question that we need to ask here. <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then it's like, you don't get the right answer, and you're like, what? what are you <laughs> the question is, why do these messages have to be repeated? Why do we have it in Revelation 14 and then again in Revelation 18? Because we often have to be beat over our heads. Yeah. But, but the thing is that in Revelation 14 you have it stated and then you have the end of the world come in Revelation 14. Because didn't it start off in 1892? It did. And so then it happened. Yeah, so exactly. Okay, that's why it's Absolutely. So the quest, that's exactly why it's repeated. But the question is then, what's the difference between the two? What's, what's really the difference? Like, you've got the minor difference of the second angel's message, right, being, you know, just kind of spoken in Revelation 14 and in Revelation 18. It's shouted with a loud voice. So you do have that. But what's the major difference between the first angel's message in Revelation 14 and the first angel's message in Revelation 18? What's the big difference? Four chapters. <laughs> <laughs> There's some time in between. <laughs> well, it's been 100 and something years from 1892, so there must be a big difference. Well, there is, but we're talking uh, 18, yeah, Revelation 18, oh, 1892, yeah, 1892, yeah. 
Okay, that is a difference. Uh, we're looking more at the messages themselves, but that is true. That is true. Talk about worshiping. Does the worshiping can pervade the heaven? Let's let's zoom out a little bit. Okay. What you know, we we looked at the difference already. What's something when you look at Revelation 18? Do you immediately see the first angel's message? Does it jump out at you, or do you kind of have to look for it? You have to, have to look for it. Why? Where's it hidden? In the first verse. In the first verse, more specifically, what does it say? Yeah, and then it was eliminated with his glory. Okay, so it's in the illumination of the earth with its glory. All righty. So, question then: What's the difference between the first angel's message in Revelation 14 and Revelation 18? Revelation 14. How do you know where is the first angel? Does the first angel's message jump out at you? It doesn't talk about the light and the glory. Doesn't talk about the light and the glory at all. Okay, instead, what happens? What do you see in in the first angel's message? Because fear God and glory to Him for the hour of His judgment. Okay, move into just verse six. Just <laughs> verse six. How is the message given? Oh, it's given through the everlasting gospel to preach those who dwell on the earth. How is it given? Through the everlasting gospel. Before that. Another angel flies. No, uh, after, after. Okay, to preach to those. Preach. Okay, so how is it given? Preaching. Preaching. Spoken. 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 Okay. Now, what's the difference between something that's spoken and something that's light? How do you how do you sense those two differences? Ah, so what's the difference between Revelation fourteen six and seven and Revelation eighteen one? What's the difference? It's spoken and then it's seen. It's and it's seen. Okay, so. The difference is that the first time it was given, people said it, but there was no action. This next time that it's going to happen, people see it. It's actually done. It's, yeah, it's not theoretical. You're going to see the character and the people transforming. You're going to see the character of Christ in people. You're going to see the gospel living in people. Yes. Which is what we should be seeing all Of course. But then you'll also hear the loud message of Babylon has fallen. Right? Because the Bible says, don't be just hearers, be doers. Yes, exactly. Do not be forgetful hearers like a man who walks up to the mirror, sees what he looks like, and then walks away and immediately forgets. Right? That's, you know, that's the book of James. So what we have here is instead of someone who just has a theoretical, pharisaical knowledge of what things are supposed to happen or what things are good and right and true instead we now have a witness yeah a witness we have an actual demonstration yeah. of the character of god it's living the message i always yeah. tell people you know it, it's because a lot of us have theoretical knowledge but are we living after we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not we're we're yeah. yeah that's right yeah so question why did the loud cry or more, or the first angels missed. Why did that fail last time? Because we didn't, it's a, we didn't separate the society. In context of what we were talking about. Because they, because they didn't do it. They talked about it, they didn't do it. They said, fear God and give glory to him. You know, hey, the judgment's coming and you got to observe the Sabbath. But they didn't do anything about it. They didn't. It. Exactly. Yeah. They may have been practicing keeping the Sabbath. They may have been practicing, oh, you know, we need to do this. We need to live in the judgment. Yeah. They didn't have a true transformation of heart and character. Mm -hmm. Of course. Fear of God. If you look in uh, Proverbs 1 7, uh, fear of God is the knowledge, right? No. Fear of God can give glory. Him. Okay, so having the knowledge of God is one thing, but it says and give glory to Him. So it's so they had the knowledge, saying with a loud voice, "Fear God." So they had the knowledge, but it says and give glory to Him. So it's this is back to one of those conditional things. Here, here is this and do this part too. Mm -hmm. Okay. So where the fear of God part comes in is that, and, and we should stress to everybody, sweet hour of prayer, first morning time, that, that time that we spend in the, the Bible, that you know, our mind explodes because we 
stuff something new for the first time and we've read it 20 times, you know. But that's the fear of God part. And give glory to Him. Now, why? Why? Mm -hmm. Because the hour of His glory was come. Okay, Sister White, from what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, we could have been done with all this mess. Uh, I think about three times over, yeah. Yeah. You know, but we didn't do our part. I also want to go off and just say this message applies to the rest of the world. Oh my goodness, thank you so much. Oh no, no, no. Praise God. You know, because God works through us, but then it's always just that pointing them to Jesus, pointing them to his kids. Yeah. We're just vessels, yeah. really. Well, and it goes it goes even beyond that. You know, coming from as someone who is uh, you know involved in medical missionary work and, and health reform and things like that, when you deal with people who are sick and you're able to take care of them, and you're able to provide you know something that actually can heal them. You know, I think of herbs and things like that and hydrotherapy and such. When you're involved in the process from beginning to end, which you would be and if you're doing things the way that God has asked us to do them, if you're involved in the whole process from immediately talking to the person, consulting with them, and things like that, and saying, okay, well here, you know, making recommendations for herbs and, you know, and, you know, applicate hydrotherapy applications and things like that, to the actual use of those things, to say, okay, well here, I'm going to, we're going to take you over here, we're going to mix the herbs for you right here, and then we're going to go in here and we're going to actually do the, the hydrotherapy right now in this place. Okay? When you're, you know, at each step, you're praying, you're asking for God's power to intervene, for God's power to come in. You're acknowledging that it's only his power that actually has the ability to heal, that these are just vehicles for his healing power to come in and be used. You know, when you're involved in, the, in you're doing that the whole way through, people, are, that makes an impression. Yeah, because you're constantly refining them, and it's right. Yeah. Yeah, and people get yeah, and people gain confidence in that. They they recognize that you know you're. You know, I mean, it, it makes a big impact on people. And then the and then the last, well, hey, why do you do this? Why are you so involved in this? Mm -hmm. Like, well, it's because it's not my power or not my knowledge. Um, can I read a just a little thingy from Ellen White yeah. regarding eighteen one five? I can focus on this. Revelation 18 points to the time when, as a result of rejecting the threefold warning of Revelation 14, 6 to 12, the church will have fully reached the condition foretold by the second angel, and the people of God still in Babylon will be called upon to separate from her communion. This message is the last that will ever be given to the world, and it will accomplish its work. All righty. Awesome. Now, let's take a look at an actual historical quote from 1893 when this happened. Um, now this, you won't find this in any of the official publications of the Adventist Church, only because, well, I mean, it is technically an official publication, but you'll, it, you'll be hard-pressed to find it, because it's, uh, it's not actually been published in an Adventist publication. It was published in Kellogg's, because this was uh, part of that uh, this was part of Kellogg's talks that he gave in 1893 that were conveniently struck off the record <laughs> because they didn't like what he had to say. Um, but you can find these still. Uh, Medical Missionary Extra Number 1, March 1893, page 37, paragraph 10. I have a copy of this, uh, an, uh, an electronic PDF copy. It's, I think, 163 pages. Oh, I love it. Uh, 163 pages. Um, I printed it out for Gomez way back in the day, uh, and that was quite the... <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a lot of paper. <laughs> um, at any rate, I'm going to read here, and this was Kellogg speaking here, uh, and he's uh, speaking in the general conference session. Brother Jones, and this is A.T. Jones here, uh, may be right in thinking that the time has come for the loud cry to begin. But if the loud cry has been begun by our people, it must be because we have just begun to do a little in the way of letting our light shine. And again, he's, this is in the context of a quote from 1892, the loud cry of the third angel has already begun. Right. Ellen White said this, Jones, A.T. Jones took this, he gave, I think, a 
part series on the third angel's message um, and all sorts of things like that at the same uh, same session. And so Kellogg then responds to this. He says, but we have done so little in that way, that is letting our light shine through medical missionary work, uh, that it seems to me that before the loud cry will make any great noise in the world, we will have to let our light shine a great deal brighter than we have ever yet done because the works come first. The light must shine through these good works before we can be called the repairers of the breach and the restorers of paths to dwell in. For that promise comes after all of these conditions, you see. We had a testimony over 30 years ago, the 1860s. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a, long, that's a lot longer ago than, than 30 years now. Uh, we had a testimony over 30 years ago saying that we as a people were to rise higher and higher, but it does not appear from testimonies received at different times since that one was given that we have risen perceptibly from that time to now, a time of over 30 years. Well, he would be pretty disappointed today because, we, if anything, we've fallen farther down than we were before. How is a loud cry going to be given through us when a large part of the denomination are 30 years behind time and sounding a note altogether out of tune? We must do the work which the Lord has told us to do and which we have left undone. We must do our duty in relation to health principles and benevolence in connection with other questions. So he's not saying that this should be the whole thing. He's saying that it's in connection with other things, right? So it's, he's not talking about a one-sided gospel here. He's not talking about health reform and doing things for others without any regard for the eternal situation of the souls that we're working with. He's talking about both. Right? We must heed the light and accept the whole truth before we can expect the Lord to sound a loud cry through us. Kellogg was right on the money, and the problem was that nobody wanted to hear it, and so turned away. <laughs> the problem was that it touches on human uh, selfishness and human pride. Yeah, they didn't want to give up. Yeah, their 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 eating habits, their uh, other things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but particularly relating to the health message, I recall an interesting story. Um, this was after Kellogg. Uh, Kellogg eventually started to get into things that were not. Um, sound theology. Um, he ended up at one point uh, saying that he believed that the Holy Spirit was the force of gravity and that um, you could find the Holy Spirit in an old boot as much as you could find it in a saint. Well, didn't he, so, I mean, didn't he, believe it all he did. He did. Just... What happened was the ministers made war on him and they made his work twice as difficult as it was supposed to be and he was he kept being told you need to work together with them and they wouldn't work with him. And he was going, well, how do I work together with somebody that's not going to work with me? And finally, he threw up his hands and went, fine, I'll do it myself. Oh. And that's when things started to go downhill. She was really hard. She was. Well, she was practically his, yeah. his mother. Uh, on, on, his, on, on her deathbed, Kellogg's mother charged Ellen White with making sure that her boys would get into the kingdom as much do everything in her power and Ellen White did she did everything that she could to save those boys yeah exactly um, yeah and she did she sent, she sent him letter after letter after letter I think he's the most written to person or the second most written to person that she ever wrote to just absolutely yeah but um, he ended up getting into some odd things and you know things that shouldn't. He did. He did. A lot of... He did. He did. But unfortunately, he, he, yeah, he did it yeah. In his own way. yeah, and uh, even so, he ended up being uh, disfellowshipped from the church because you know you can't yeah, you know field. he went off uh, left field is too too <laughs> kind a way to put it. Um, he was really out there, but um, I. At, Towards the end of his life, he started advocating nudism for health. Um, just some really nudism, yeah, really, really bizarre things. Yeah, he did. Um, but even afterward, he was still a very generous man, and he ended up allowing the uh, general conference uh, sessions to be hosted at the sanitarium several times, even though it was no longer part of the Adventist church. And um, one time when that happened, 
the um, the ministers were going to, uh, you know, they, they'd all finish the conference for, you know, whatever, they recessed for lunch. So they go into the cafeteria where all the patients are. Now, uh, if you don't know anything about the sanitarium, you know that the, uh, you know, the they advocated for vegetarianism and, and such, the, you know, health, but, you know, healing people by lifestyle treatments and things like that, as well as hydrotherapy and sunlight and all sorts of other things. And um, they, uh, you know, so this big cafe, cafeteria they had was, it was essentially a buffet, uh, but they had way over in the corner, if you were prescribed meat, because sometimes people were prescribed to eat meat if they had specific conditions. And in the old days when diabetes was only sugar in the urine, which is, a th you know, they didn't know how to measure blood sugar and that sort of a thing. So it was all just if you had sugar in the urine, which is, of course, if you know anything about diabetes now, really, really far advanced diabetes. The only way that they knew to keep blood sugar down was to have them on meat. And so and now we know better. Right? Sure. Yeah, exactly. And now they still recommend that a lot of people, but, you know, if you know anything about lifestyle medicine, you know that actually you don't want a high meat diet. But... That being said, um, you did have a, you know, way off in the corner, you had a little window that you could get the meat that you were prescribed, whatever, and it wasn't very much that you would get, and then you had all this really good vegetarian food laid out. Well, all the ministers, every single one of them, without fail, they get into the cafeteria, they all go over to that little meal uh, window, get, uh, get meat, piles of it, and then they go and sit down in front of all the patients and eat these piles of meat. No. Now, yeah, um, the minister who told this story uh, that I heard it first from said, well, now that really frosted Kellogg's flakes. He did not like that. <laughs> yeah, that's not my joke, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And so, you know, this is that's the situation that was going on. It was, you know, it was it was terrible. That's the attitude of the ministers towards these kind of a things. So it it really <laughs> it really made a big problem. So the question then comes to us: Will we actually do it this time? Yes, we will. It says it's going to work. So it needs the coming of the Lord. Yeah, yeah. Really, the bottom line is, well, let me get to this here first. I, here. Yes. Seventh volume of the Testimonies, page 62, paragraph 1. We have come to a time when every member of the church should take hold of medical missionary work. Question. How many people are left out of every member of the church? Every member, every, every. Now, the only people who are left out are people who aren't members of the church, right? Every member of the church should take hold of medical missionary work. Benevolent. Councils on Health, sorry. Benevolent. Yes. Councils on Health, page 533, paragraph 1. I wish to tell you that soon there will be no work done in ministerial lines but medical missionary work. So, what do you think about that? Well, it's because it's the only thing we ever should have done. <laughs> it's, yeah. Go ahead. I kept it. It says that this work there is great and the world is open for it. God grant that the importance of medical missionary work shall be understood and that new fields may be immediately planted. Then will the work of the ministry be after the Lord's order. The sick will be healed and the poor suffering humanity will be blessed out of the Uh Page 233. And I love that. Thank you. So now I have a question. So medical missionary work is supposed to be this final phase. Mm -hmm. So how many people are in the hospital? Person, how many people are in the medical city? Yeah. You know, so if medical missionary work is going to have to be the outreach to the people, how is that going to happen? Mm -hmm. It has to it's... work the hubs and the churches where they're administering to the people, you know, like in a service where we give out healthy food as opposed to the things that they have forced down there we choose and then as far as the outreach programs that we do like stop smoking or 
blood pressure checks, okay. you know, whatever. Okay. And he, these are all things that we can do to reach out yeah. to the community right from this church. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. is that our community? Is that our <laughs> no, actually, it's not. Is that our hospitals? No. Well, there are people. Measles. These, <laughs> these are centers of influence. Yes. Alan White speaks of centers of influence quite frequently, but many people make mistakes in understanding what she means by that. When she says centers of influence, she's not talking about just churches. Yes. And churches are part of it. So one of these is a church. But this one over here. A bookstore. A cook is a restaurant. Yeah, this one over here could be a restaurant. Right, so sanitarium. Yeah, sanitarium would be way out here. <laughs> a school over there in uh, Wildwood. <laughs> so far. Or we yeah, at a school. Or we were. <laughs> yeah. See, Weimar, Wildwood, yeah. those are these. Those are lifestyle centers, sanitariums, and schools. That's what the purpose of those is. And those are actually following the counsel yeah. that we were given. Weimar is as close as I've ever been to it. Uh, I don't know about Wildwood. I can't testify to that because I've never been there. My friend's there. Yeah. She was there. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, from what I understand, yeah. at least the way that it was organized, it was organized by yes. someone who was so, trained by the best evangelist we've ever had. And, so, <laughs> and was a graduate of the last class of uh, medical missionary work ever, or uh, medical missionary uh, evangelism ever given at the College of Medical uh, College of Medical Evangelism. Last course that was ever given was in 19, 1924. There is a blueprint. And, you know, let's take a look at this one. This one might be a treatment. Or, you know, some kind of clinic or something. This feeds back and forth to this. And then you might have an auto mechanic. Or ever, yeah. Well, I'm kind of be out there with the sanitarium, yeah. Auto mechanic. But you could, yeah, auto but mechanic you could be something. In there, yeah. yeah, absolutely. You could do something like, um, you know, you could do IT. Yeah. That's something you can do evangelism with. Yeah. You don't think so, but yeah, you can. Um, you can also yeah. maybe think about this now, an alternative. To a coffee shop. Oh, oh, that's true. To a Starbucks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Roma. Roma. That's the same. Sorry, they're Anderson's coffee. Everyone's coffee. Talking about that. Or, and it depends on where you are, too, yeah. because you could also do this as an alternative to a bar or pub. Oh, oh. You go over to Europe. Oh, that's Starbucks true. isn't a thing over there, it's pubs. Ireland, I'm Ireland and the UK in particular, there's there's a pub on every street, street corner. There's more pubs, I think, than there are gas stations. Like it, there's so many. So you know the you you can have an alternative to that, and you can have everything. Well, you can have so much more than any of this. These are just examples, yeah. and you only have one that's actually a church. Wow. Because you can do missionary work and evangelism work almost out of being. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You see, the, the thing is, the plan that we've been given is to do things like this, where we have member-run organizations all surrounding and feeding into the church and the church feeding into them. One example of that is Sanitarium Foods in, uh, in Australia. You know, that's still not only owned by Adventists, but it still keeps the Sabbath. All their factories are shut down Friday night to Saturday night sundown. And excess profit all goes to the Adventist church in Australia. I have a friend, um, his friend, uh, my friend, yeah. Yes. So yeah, food factories. Ellen White talks a lot about those. Um, so these we have been given all this huge plan. Yeah. The question is getting it started. <laughs> and see, that's where that's what I am. Yes. And see, that's why we've got to have entrepreneurs. We're not just looking at we're not looking at just church stuff. 
if we're looking only here, yeah, we're, we're thinking too small. See, that's the thing. I have scatterbrain, so I'm full of ideas. Mm -hmm. I know yeah, see, and I'm that way too. Ideas are good, but how do you? Yeah, you've you got to implement them, which means you've got to pick one of these and start with them. <laughs> and we've already got one. We've got the church, and we've got another one. We have a healthy restaurant here in Bakersfield. No, Yes, this is equivalent to those. Yes. What restaurant? Sorry. Uh, Nature's Food Market. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. But we also may eventually have the opportunity to do one of these, and we should. Outside of every city, should be a sanitarium and school. Yes. Every city. Not just we are. No, no. Can't have one big one. It shouldn't be big ones. They should be small. Small yeah. ones. In fact, the most successful, and we're closing up. <laughs> the most successful evangelistic campaign in history was run exactly this way. In fact, it was so successful that an entire island, and I'm not talking a small island either, an entire island was thoroughly converted to Christianity without one single martyr, despite the fact that these were human sacrificing pagans, some of whom probably were cannibals. Population. In fact, it was it was so bad there that people from nearby islands and even from the mainland that they were close to considered them to be so uh, considered the people to be so bad that they thought them as half demon. <laughs> no, no, no. We are talking the island that I happen to have only come back from relatively recently, Ireland. Oh, that's right. Were they Druids? Or no? Yes, the Druids, the pagan Irish, converted to Christianity without a fight, really. There was no bloodshed in Ireland. In fact, it's so unique that it's called the Green Martyrdom. People who went over as missionaries to Ireland were not risking their lives at all. Even you know, We have no idea why. There's no records of any martyrs in Ireland at all. But the way that they did their evangelism, they had a monastery... And another monastery, and another monastery, and another monastery all throughout the countryside that serviced a village or two here or there, maybe several villages. And they acted like sanitariums. They took care of people's needs. They walked around from town to town. One man, Saint, uh, I think the Cuthbert is his name. Uh, he, when he was a, uh, when he, he ended up being a, an evangelist in um, Northumbria, which is kind of the border between England and Wales now, Northumberland, and, um, or not England and Wales, England and Scotland. And uh, let me tell you, that man was walking 24 miles a day on average. He was walking from village to village. The only, yeah. <laughs> he was, uh, and, and see, they, all he was doing was giving people food and medical care and preaching the gospel. That's, that's what he did. And, so that was the true question. I was thinking of Advent in Ireland. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> I was being intentionally vague there. But, interestingly enough, that took place only when someone went, no, 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 I'm not going to do things the way that my people are telling me, the way that the church hierarchy are telling me. I'm going to do things the way that the Bible says. That, no. So how that's just to show how Yeah. It's because it's all in here. There are counterfeit messages that are more successful. I know. Yeah. Because they Because that's what they know. Yeah. Well keep in mind Yeah. Well, yeah, you know. yeah. Keep in mind too that this was in the 300s, Christianity and, and 400s. Christianity was still relatively yeah. new, but yeah. at the same time, it was also already under much corruption. And um, it was only in, in the 440s that the uh, it was in 445, I think, at the Council of Laodicea when the Sabbath was done away with, um, and or at least forbidden rather. Um, but prior to that, it wasn't. But interestingly enough, the Irish didn't care. They had received the gospel from the Welsh, who were Sabbatarian, and so they went right on keeping the Sabbath until the Irish church was actually dissolved uh, by the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church, which uh, now they 
don't teach anybody. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, Ellen White says that about one in twenty in her day were one in twenty were actually ready for Jesus to come. And that would be them doing this. It has been sparking up. Yes, the interest has been. I'm not the only one to say this by a long shot. Um, I'm. Uh, I'm just one of the many who have discovered this. The problem is that we're not all doing this. More people are doing this now, but we're still not doing this the way that we ought to be doing. However, sometimes, sometimes, or they limit it to, oh, just around the church. And so um, that is, that's the plan. That's That's what we're supposed to be doing. So the question then is, you know, because remember, we're looking at the shaking, right? right? So this is what we've gone over here. This is the message that caused the shaking last time. The shaking was caused when s someone stood up and said, hey, we ought to be doing this. We aren't doing things the right way. We need to allow the life of Christ to come into us, transform us, and shine through us like this, the way that we've been told that we're supposed to be doing it. Well, a little bit better. This is what I had in mind. I just, you were putting dots. It's yeah. starting to connect like that. Yeah. 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 So then. It's caused the shaking. Mm-hmm. Because people were already accepted. Exactly. Yeah. And more particularly, the health message. It's beautiful. <laughs> so the question is, yes. Ah, the shaking is a time when God's people, or when the church, uh, it's a time of great distress, which we'll be looking at more about what it looks like next week, starting next week. We're going to actually look at what the experience is going to be like. But um, the shaking is a time of great distress among those who profess to be God's people. And that time of great distress will do two things. It'll sift out those who don't really believe in God. Who just are there because they, you know, yeah, they're they're wheat and tares. You know, they're, there's people who claim to be followers of God, but they really aren't. They're there for selfish reasons. Their their hearts aren't changed or converted, and they refuse to allow them to be converted. On the other hand, and those people are removed from the church. On the other hand, you have those who are actual followers of God, right? and those people are shaken together. So they come together, they group up. The and they bond. Ezekiel. Yes, exactly. The bones of Ezekiel chapter 37, you know, the valley of dry bones. And then I saw, you know, behold, shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And then the breath of life comes into them, and they stand up on their feet, an exceedingly great army. So it's two aspects. No. Separated. No. It's for us. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And if you want to know about it, you can check out the YouTube channel up there because uh, that's where all the stuff is archived. So uh, you can find all of that on the early parts of the shaking. The first uh, three parts of this, um, you can find it. Actually, the first two, I think, you can find that on there. <laughs> but that, what we're going to be looking at next week is what the shaking experience will be like for us, what what will it be like? How will it feel? What's the? So there's going to be you know. some emotion. Oh. oh yeah, absolutely. This is something you know. Like I said, it's a time of great distress. You know, so we're going to look take a look at that. Please don't miss out. This is a very important part of it, and it's also linked up to another important piece of prophecy that you might have heard of: the time of Jacob's trouble. Right. It's very very intimately linked with that, um, and. The shaking happens first. The time of Jacob's trouble is at the very, very end. It's There's right a, before Jesus comes. Now, the little time of trouble is where we get the intimate that you A little time of trouble happens right. at the time of the loud cry right. and the latter rain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a little time of trouble, and then there's the great time of trouble, which is equivalent with the time of Jacob's trouble. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any questions? Anything like that? Cool. On the actual experience of the shaking, yeah.
This is, you know, you wouldn't think that studying the shaking would <laughs> stretch out this much, but it's a topic that honestly the Bible talks about a whole lot. And just looking at, and, and we've, we haven't even actually looked really at the, the shaking itself. We've looked at what causes it more than anything else. So, uh, and that's really important because we're about ready for that to happen again. That's why we're, that's why we're looking at this. Because this message, you notice, as they've said, it's starting to go out. People are starting to say this, which means that we're not far from the shaking happening again. Yes, hurry it up. Yes, please. We need to get off this planet. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, that's true. That's true as well. As Rick pointed out, we could have, we could, this whole thing could have ended at least three times by now. Yeah, see? Now we get to see the female. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. Let's go ahead and close out, and I will see you guys next week. It's far. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your grace and for your mercy, for the love that you have for us. And thank you, Lord, as well, that you have not left us in the dark about events like this, uh, about the shaking and about um, the things that are going to cause the shaking. And uh, moreover, Lord, that you have not left us in the dark about how to do the work that you've asked us to do, but that you have given us a plan, a framework upon which to build. Lord, we just ask for wisdom to build upon that framework uh, for resources to do it, and uh, for the drive and passion to do it, that we may have receive, see the value of each and every individual. Lord, when we look at just even one person, the value of worlds falls into insignificance. So, Lord, please help give us that passion. And moreover, Lord, give us what we need to accomplish this work. Thank you so much again for everything. Please keep us until we should meet again. Let these things sink in and affect our hearts and lives. Thank you so much again. In Jesus' name we pray and ask all these things. Amen.